Hey, Harp Slingers, welcome to the Harp Slinger podcast, where each and every week we hang out with the greatest harmonica players in the music business. As always, if you're watching this on the Honer Music Facebook page, there's a live chat below. Go ahead and share that to your homepage, to your personal Facebook page. Help us spread the word about all of these wonderful harmonica players out there. There's so many, and we have an incredible backlog on the uh, Harp Slinger YouTube channel. If you haven't been there yet, it's worthwhile. You need to go check it out. There's a whole bunch of, in fact, 33 episodes to date of your favorite harmonica players and many more to come. So there's so much insight there, uh, so many interesting people and some really great stories. So you don't want to miss it. While you're there, hit the subscribe button and ding the bell. That way we can keep you up to date on what's happening uh, with the Harp Slinger podcast and all the great talent that we have coming down the pike. Lots of that on the way. In fact, we have a great one here today. My next guest is one of the most sought-after blues talents in the Northwest. The Washington Blues Society has awarded him for Best Vocalist, Songwriter, and Harmonica Player more than any other artist. He's also a Grammy nominee and a WC Handy Award winner for his work with Room Full of Blues. Here he is, the one and only Mr. Mark Dufresne. How you feeling, my friend? How you doing today? I'm good. It's, it's good to be with my cult uh, here and. a... Uh... I feel like that, that that's what this is the harmonica cult out there it's sort of a strange little uh, group i completely <laughs> expect a sort of a strange sort of demonic worship service with matthias honer coming out of a you know, <laughs> thing a, you know, so. yeah well you know we are sort of a bit of a cult we're, we're a tight-knit cult a community yeah, maybe it's, might it's, be a it's, it's one thing it's good about it is an instrument because it's not an, you know accepted in the sense of guitar keyboards uh, and and whatnot it, it, there's, there's a certain camaraderie mm-hmm. there's a certain sort of friendly rivalry you know if you will or for the most part but there's certain there's a certain amount of camaraderie uh between the different players and stuff and that's that's that i do a lot of harmonica shows with some other northwest guys around here that are you know pretty doggone good and yeah. mm-hmm. uh, uh you know some of which are much more well known than i am uh but you know, there's always that kind of uh, the friendly rivalry kind of thing. But everybody kind of uh, you know respects the other other person and what they do. Absolutely, I have I have found you know I, I'm sort of a, uh, I've been playing harmonica for many many years, but until COVID, I didn't really have the opportunity to sort of explore the harmonica community online. You know, and I found all of these chat rooms and all of these pages on on uh, on Facebook and uh, you know I've just come to learn what a wonderful community uh, YouTube, supportive you know, yeah and YouTube YouTube's where you go when you, when you when I hear a bunch of guys that are way better than you are you know just so they keep, you know just to, just to keep you humble and, uh, you know. that's it I know I know it's almost disheartening sometimes but it's it's encouraging right I think it's it's good it makes I think you know I'm a big believer I'm a I'm a capitalist at heart and I think that uh, I think uh competition of uh right. makes you makes you strive to be better there's something you know everybody's got something you can learn from so everybody does something that you can learn but everybody's you know can always uh, expand on what they do by listening to other people you know and there are a few guys that come along where uh in blues when kim wilson came out so to speak mm-hmm. uh you know you can everybody else jumped their game up everybody got better after that, which I can't say that for many musicians. I can say that for Charlie Parker, yeah. for John Coltrane, uh, certainly for Hendrix and Clapton on rock guitar, you know, Van Halen later, and a variety of other people. But when that cat came out, you know, it's doing a straight blues thing. It, it Everybody's game stepped up. So that's about the ultimate compliment I can give somebody. Yeah, and, and they were being played on major hit radio. I mean, uh, well, later on they did get, they did achieve that. But you know, they sort of received their cult. Their cult status was in like seventy seven through about eighty one. You know, they were, you know, they were like, and yeah. Tight. If you went to their show, there'd just be too many harmonica players out there. You know, <laughs> not, all trying to band. steal something. Absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, just to hear a guy with that kind of control and mm-hmm. uh, that sort of a, he had what. Hollywood Fats had on guitar. He had what I call a genius for recall. In other words, he could channel up a lot of different players. So it was, it was like everybody you'd ever heard, but nobody you'd ever heard before. You know, and right. was, uh, you know, and uh, like I say, there's only a few people I can, uh, you know, that I can say something like that about. You know, sure. among all these really mon- monster players that are out there. I mean. Uh-huh. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty amazing how many uh, 
how many great players are, are out there, you know, whether it's in blues or the guys that do the overblows, yeah. you know, the jazz type uh, guys. Yeah. And there's always some, every town now has one or two like chromatic uh, jazz guys around. It used to be, it was Toot Seelman's and maybe Mike Turk and a couple of these guys. And then suddenly every town has a couple of these knuckleheads that, uh, you know, <laughs> pop out there, you know, yeah, I'm ready for the, you know, ready for some train, you know. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Right on. Well, you know, I, I count you as among one of those incredibly gifted and talented players as well. Also a diatonic and chromatic player. Well, yeah. that's, that's appreciated. I, you know, I don't put myself in the upper echelons of it, but I certainly, uh, I can cover, you know, enough bases of different kinds of things that I try to shoot that into what I'm doing. Basically, it's really meant to augment, you know, my singing as uh-huh. well. Although I didn't start out that way. I was a harmonica player who refused to sing and then it was thrust into it against my will really? and, okay. i definitely want to that's absolutely true uh, a guy named rick howell uh, who's in the north carolina now uh, brought me to the northwest and uh, he basically said well we're going to do a duo and you're going to have to sing if i'll sing two or three and you got to do the rest because outside of that i don't really need a harmonica player so that's kind of <laughs> Here's these 40 songs, learn these songs, you know, and that was right. Kind of, right. Eventually I wised up and I took some lessons. Uh, okay. All right. Well, now Vo- you're, uh, vocal lessons. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, I want to hear all about that. You're, now you're originally from Kansas city, right? Yes. Yes, I am. Yeah. Great, great music town as well. Great town. Not when I was there. Oh, I, really? Most people say that, you know, because it's got that history from the thirties. Yeah in the forties where it was a, you know, a free swinging jazz town. And this is when, you know, Tom Pendergast ran the town and, you know, it was the most corrupt city in the United States. But on the other hand, it had the best live music, you yeah. know, the, the best brothels, the best, you know, everything like yeah. that. The best steak um, probably. <laughs> the best steak. <laughs> the best steak. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, but that, as soon as Pendergast was out, that pretty much died off. So when I was a kid, in the 60s and then into the 70s there wasn't that much live music there was some top 40 rock and some top 40 country on the outskirts of the burbs mm-hmm. little to hardly any blues whatsoever there were you know there were hippie bands that used to play in the if you're familiar with kansas city the sunday Volker park scene okay you know, that's where the garage bands would gather the oh, tribes oh, wow. would gather there on sundays and uh, it's still Volker park is still there but not uh, it was a very interesting five-year period there. And I first heard guys there. I heard a guy from who now lives in Colorado named Clay Kirkland, uh-huh. um, who was a huge influence on me at the time. He had a band called Grits uh, with a wonderful guitarist, Neil Haverstick. And they had, you know, the four-piece, the guitar, harmonica, bass, drums, wow. kind of thing. And they were kind of a psychedelic sort of a psychedelic blues band if you were and uh, he could play very fast stuff Uh Uh they did a lot of unison guitar harmonica unison things which i hadn't really heard too many people do before and uh, right right so you know they were very different than uh, most other uh, any other bands in can in the kansas city area and so that was a you know i started playing in college you okay. know, yeah, I was just going to say, when did you pick up and was that maybe your influence or were you already playing and then you, you found these guys? No, I, I just, you know, I was like just getting out of high school and I kind of picked up, my dad gave me a big one of those oversized Marine bands, you know, yeah, for my birthday. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, get it. And, uh, I couldn't bend any notes or any of that. I couldn't figure out how that worked, especially on those big Marine bands. It just, yeah. you know, yeah. and finally I spent the $3.25 and got the blues harp. Yeah. Right. And I, the G and I, and the first thing I ever learned was uh, um, Smokestack Lightning, the Yardbirds version, yeah. which is on a C harp. And I learned it on a G harp. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, and I learned note for note, the Keith Relf version of it. And that's yeah. kind of what, you know, I thought it was Jesus there for about 10 minutes when I figured that <laughs> out. Now, I had no idea what first position, second, third position. I had no inkling of that. Right. I'd heard the name Sonny Boy Williamson. I'd heard of Little Walter, but I had no. It was a couple of years after that that I started uh, scrounging up those records. And, uh, right, right. Um, and at that time, Mark, there was like, uh, you know, it wasn't like today where you can just get on YouTube and go oh, find this stuff. I mean, yeah, I it was like you were up to your own devices, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I feel like sometimes like the crotchety old man. You know, I didn't have it so easy when I was like you kids, you know. Uh, and 
it's a funny thing I, that you mentioned that because I, but the good part of that is for anybody who's in there, I'd say 50 and up that's, you know, plays blues or plays any kind of uh, music is that there is something to be said about the commitment you have when you have vinyl as opposed to CDs. And mm -hmm. there's something to be said about going out into the record stores and meeting up with other people at the record stores and getting turned on to what, what, whatever kind of music. Yeah. And it is a community of sound, if you will. Yeah. And, and, and that YouTube is everything's at your fingertips. But I find that it's amazing to me. I see some younger players and they're really not uh, savvy to a lot of the stuff that's out there because everything's too easy. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. just, you know, whereas before you'd go through and say, who's this James Cotton guy? You know, and right. who's this, you know, uh, you know, who's, you know, who's Petey Wheatstraw, who's, you know, who's, yeah. you know, whatever, uh, Willie the Lion Smith, whatever, you know, jazz blues, whatever it's, you know, that kind of stuff that was that, that sort of that, exploration at the used record store which is basically where i lived was at the used record store nice it's like so, a gathering spot for for audio files right i miss it i miss it i worked in that business for well over 15 years wow and uh and uh i was just in kansas city uh and there's actually some new used record stores opening up again and it's kind of like yeah well this is really kind of neat uh it is neat yeah don't have too much in seattle yet we're kind of i'm surprised um, seattle seems like a very like a like a like a vinyl kind of town it was you know I, it yeah. was you know and there's still there's pockets it's, it's, it hasn't uh -huh. disappeared but um yeah it, it, it's uh you know of course you know times change so you know but some things come back and i've seen a comeback in vinyl uh -huh. uh, that i didn't expect which yeah. uh which was good because I sold some of my records and actually got <laughs> nice. but, uh, <laughs> yeah well you know how it is when you work in the business you tend your collection tends to you know <laughs> it, it grows and it's it, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it's like you've got 1500 albums and you're you know <laughs> you know you start to think am I really listening to uh, you know it's, uh, you know yeah. Kurt there anymore I don't know <laughs> Just, yeah. I just unloaded a bunch of CDs. Times of time, different time, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's like I can get all this stuff on Spotify now. I know, I and like I said, it's almost, yeah. it's almost too it's easy. Like sacrilege, it, right? I know it's. It's not so much that. It's just that you know, it, there's. I guess because there's so much out, and when you can't look at it, you forget about some really great things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. You just forget about some stuff out there, and no matter what kind of music it is, whether it's in you know prog rock or right. you know you, if you were into punk and that kind of thing. I was into all. I worked in the business, so I was kind of into everything. Nice. Uh, and you know, once in a while, I come across some great harmonica records. You know, some yeah. guy that I you know that I some cl chromatic guy from Czechoslovakia that I'd never heard of before. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So right, yes, yeah. right. I, I feel you. So, well, you know that was that was an advantage. Uh, that, that, definitely, definitely. Well, do, Mark, do you come from a, a musical family? My dad played a little bit of organ, and he was always and he insisted that I take organ lessons as a kid, and I okay. did, and it was, it was a disaster. You know, okay. I, I think if the teacher hadn't been making me play, it was one thing like you know really boring scales. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I work a lot on scales, yeah, but anyway, at the time, you know, when you're, you're nine, it's not fun, and you know, and the tunes. <laughs> You know the tunes with the tiptoe through the tulips kind of stuff and yes. you know and i i just wanted to play if you could have shown me in a double shot of my baby's love by the swinging medallions that would have been i would have stuck with it you know my sister surpassed me she was a you know very quickly because i just i just wouldn't practice uh -huh. but i had the ear for music and the love of it i just you know i just was not into the regimentation of it sure I right. thought I was going to be the next Mickey Mantle. Wrong. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you settled for harmonica. I love it. And then that kind of came along by accident when I started college. You know, it was, okay. uh, yeah. and, you know, it was good. It that allowed me to go. We used to go to jam garage jam sessions all the time. Here okay. and that allowed yeah. me to kind of step into it a little bit and participate. Right, right. Uh, Did you have anybody around you at that point that was uh, that was showing you some ropes on the harp, or were you just learning off the just off records? I would have, I would have given anything to have had like a, yeah. you know, like the down, you know, the next uh, the Rick Estrin down the street, you know, or right. you know the, uh, yes. you know, somebody like uh, you know, uh, 
any of those kind of guys. I just kind of had to learn. Everything has been a learning process and a ton of mistakes. That's essentially my method of, uh, mm-hmm. of, of learning things is just make a whole ton of mistakes and, uh, and figure out, you know, listen to yourself and go, what the hell was I thinking about? You know, and that, that kind of stuff. And that's sort of, you know, I did take a few chromatic lessons from a man named Richard Martin who hung out with a lot of the old harmonica band guys. He okay. was younger than them, but he could read and he played classical guitar and he could play chromatic harmonica well. And, um, and so he gave some lessons. So I did a, I did a couple of months of lessons with him and that's where I learned how to tongue block because okay. I, I, I played kind of a, uh, I described my blues playing as kind of Paul Butterfield meets Charlie McCoy. Mm-hmm. Kind of a, oh. a straight hole type playing, and uh, I can't think of, of a better place to be, Mark, between those but, two. Well, they're great, right. you know, but yeah. I'm just saying for you know, for later on when I started getting into more serious blues, I realized that there was something. I came when I came northwest, I thought I was kind of a cock of the walk in Kansas City because there really weren't very many harmonica players there, very few, and uh, uh, when I came up here, I you know, the first guy I meet. Uh, was Kim Field. Uh-huh. And I heard him play and I go, wow, that guy, guy's got a huge tone. Jeez, I wonder what is he doing for that, you know? And yeah, then, right. And then I heard, uh, then I met Rick Estrin, who uh-huh. was playing with a, a, a with little Charlie at the time. They came to Bellingham, Washington, which is where I was living. And I heard them and I, I met Curtis Salgado and, uh, yeah. and then they turned me on to Paul DeLay, which really freaked me out. Mm-hmm. I heard him and they also, Kim Field made me some tapes of the Thunderbirds and and some of the other guys and so, and then I met there was a there's a great one of the best players in the world for a folk music for fiddle music on a harmonica, is Mark Graham. Okay. And he's a, Se- a Seattle guy and okay. actually quite a good re- songwriter that's not unlike myself either kind of a warped kind <laughs> of kind of sort of a warped uh, view of the world so that's my kind of guy. Um, <laughs> And Mark, but he could play all the American fiddle music basically in first position. And he's just, he's, you know, he's one of the best I've ever heard at that. Yeah. You know, Irish, Irish music, anything uh-huh. like that. He can just, he, he just knocks it down. He's tremendous. And uh, so, you know, there wasn't just blues guys. It was him and there was Jay Maven who plays jazz mostly and also can do the Howard Levy thing really well. Okay. He plays chromatic and bass. Uh-huh. And, uh, so I heard some of these guys and I thought, boy, I am, I got a lot of work to do. Here. Yeah. You stepped into a hotbed of great players. I, there were some great players and I, you know, uh, I remembered there was something. So I spent the next year moved to Wichita, Kansas and then Minneapolis for a while. Uh, and that's where I spent, you know, two years kind of woodshedding, kind of having to retrain myself to play. Yeah. Basically going into a tongue blocking style. Okay. I, that was the thing, you know, and I wasn't really, I realized by listening to Big Walter, I'd been listening to Little Walter and Big Walter for riffs, not for their sound. Right. Or Sonny Boy, you know, when I heard, yeah. Sir, I heard Sir, Sir Sonny Boy when I was 2021 20, and it was on those uh, trumpet recordings. Uh-huh. Yeah, I loved it, the, the, the playing, but I wasn't really listening for the tone like I should have been. I was kind of listening for riffs. And, I think uh, that's what young guys do. I mean, I did that yeah, as well. Yeah that's, yeah, that's kind of what you do. It's just like a guitar player. You listen to that, you go, there's a, man, there's a lot more to it than riffs. And I wasn't, uh, I wasn't there, you know. But when I heard these guys live, uh-huh. then it kind of like, there was something I said, there's something I'm really missing here. You know, there's right. a, there's something I'm really missing in my playing here. And so I spent some time. I lived with, you may have heard of uh, Linwood Slim. Yeah. Richard Duran. Yeah. Now, when I was in Minneapolis, he was my roommate. Okay. There was, right. there was quite a house right there. It was I between, bet. He was something else. Uh, <laughs> great, great player, just a great front man. And uh, he produced my third album that I did in LA with uh, the Hollywood Fats Band. Uh-huh. Minus, of course, minus you know, Michael Mann, of course. But right. With Kid Ramos instead. Okay. And nothing wrong with having Kid Ramos back there. No, uh, he's fantastic. He's done a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, absolutely. Monster, you know. And yeah. uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's, so, you know, he made the, I got to meet and play with Larry Taylor and Richard Dennis, Freddie Kaplan, these guys, you know, the kind of uh-huh. the cream of the LA, LA, as he called it. He said, I can give you my B team or I can give you my A team. It'll cost you a little more money for the A team. <laughs> but I want the A team. You know? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> 
of yeah, course. Of course, you know, and it's Larry Taylor and, and you know. Larry was a Larry was a real trip to work with, you know, just would raise high holy hell in the studio. But Linwood Slim comes up to me and Slim and Larry was throwing the mic around or something. And he goes, you know, don't pay any attention to Larry. Uh, you know, he gets like this. Uh, we let it, we put up with it because uh, he's right most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> he had the mind of a producer, so he'd say, you know, this one we don't need guitar on this. Let's do this. You know, yeah. we don't kill the piano on this tune. And uh, um, you know that, and he he just had an ear for you know how to make what's going to make the sound. Yes. You know, you know and uh, so he was a really good guy. That's amazing that uh, you moved to town and, and within, I guess, a few short years, you're, you're surrounded by all of these wonderful, inspirational people that you're learning a lot from. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, yes. I mean, it, it was, uh, it was pretty overwhelming. It was, yeah. it was pretty overwhelming to uh, be around that. Plus, you know, like I said, uh, you know, at that, that time people started trading tapes. Uh -huh. So there were bootleg tapes floating around, okay. you know, People, yeah, I mean, Rick Estrin used to occasionally send me gospel tapes. Right on. Yeah. Rick Estrin's so cool. He's the coolest yeah, dude he, ever, right? He really is. And yeah. uh, he occasionally would turn me on to, you know, he knew I was in the gospel singers. Uh huh. And uh, he'd send me up a cassette of Rance Allen or somebody that I wasn't real familiar with. And, yeah. uh, you know, some stuff like that. He just, you know, because Rick's as much into the singers as he is the harmonica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's he a really correlation is. there. I think there's a between singing and, and the harmonica. They're both such a vocal instrument. They're both exactly. on the breath. Uh, so much there that coincides. It, it, yes, it, it, it's kind of expected that if you're playing the harmonica, unless you're in a band where that's, you know, expected that your best what pal, you're going to be the singer. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> totally, totally. That's certainly what happened to me. Um, yeah. You know, you're going to be the, you know, you're the, you're, you were been elected the front man. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. You know, when I spoke with, I spoke with Curtis Salgado a, a month or so ago, and he's a big fan of a gospel singers as well. You yes. Know, big fan. Um, yes, yes. And he, you know, he considers himself a, a singer first a harmonica player as his sort of a silver bullet. Um, I just have to ask, what is it? What is up with you guys out on the West coast that, is there something in the water? Because your vocals, the singing going on out there is really some of the best singing I've I've heard in a long, long time. I Yourself, think so. Hank yeah. Shreve, Curtis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's, uh, I think some of it's the competition. Okay. It makes you get better, yeah. as I said before. Uh, but you're so yeah. soulful. It's a soulful yeah. thing. It's not, uh, you know, and it doesn't seem uh, forced or faked or any of that. BS. It just seems like really real and fantastic. I don't know. Well, it's uh, you know, like I say, one thing is is that you know you spend just like with the voice is another instrument in the sense that you spend you spend a lot of times on these records, you know, and you do like you did with the harmonica. You you try to learn how to imitate note for note. Right. BB King or you know Archie Brown Lee or Clarence Fountain or yeah. Johnny Taylor. You know any of the little Milton Johnny Lee, Taylor and you try right. to get those. You know, I first started singing in the car before. I didn't start singing until I was 26, so I was kind of old. That's mind-blowing, actually. You you sound like you've been singing, like, since you came out of the womb. Well, I'm just old now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love I'm just it. Old, you know? I love but it. I started late, and I, Curtis was going in 15, 16. He was already pretty good. And then uh, yeah. I had no, you know, I had, was way too shy to even think about trying that. And uh, But I tried to sing, like, Helen Wolf, and I figured out, one or two sessions in the car, that was not going to happen. You know, this, yeah. I said, there's a, you know. That's a whole other thing, right? Unless I start chewing on steel wool, that was not <laughs> going to be the, right. not going to be my fate. Uh, right. I still consider that, if you pin me down, I'd probably say he's probably still, if I have to pick one for a blue singer, I'd have to say Wolf. Uh -huh. That's hard to say because there's so many people in the uh -huh. Yeah, I have to say, Wolf is probably still my favorite guy of them all. You know, male, male or female, because yeah. uh, I love a lot of the big May Bell is oh. one of my favorite singers. Uh, yeah, yeah, Coco Taylor, Eddie James. Of, oh yeah, Eddie I mean, you know, it is, uh, the. Uh, but yeah, I had if you if you corner me with the uh, forty-five, yeah, I think I got to go with Wolf. 
Um, you know, there's something about his voice that's like almost spooky. It's like it really affects you. I was 19 and I heard moaning at midnight on my mono stereo system in my uh-huh. bedroom. About two in the morning, I was half asleep and that thing came out and it just like, yeah, it chilled me. It really did. It was like, wow, that was when I really was like, this is, you know, this can't be reproduced. <laughs> it, it, you cannot, this cannot be, this cannot be reproduced. This is, you know, this guy, this band, in this, this studio, you know, uh-huh. which turns out a lot of it was on out of Sun, Sun Records and not Chess. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Recorded at Sun, of course, and then leased to Chess. But uh, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, that. a lot of those Wolf recordings that we own were crazy. Some of them, uh, a lot of, particularly anything that had Willie Johnson on guitar, most of that is, I believe, out of Sun Records. Okay, you know, that, that was Sam Phillips' favorite guy. Oh, right on. Yeah, Wolf, you know, it was like we thought it was this is the most, you know, original American singer. You know. It's, Sam it's Phillips hard. was a strange, strange individual, but uh, maybe a genius because, like, all the stuff. That, I mean, that guy, come on. That, he know. just had it. He had a head to know what this is really. You know, this is new. This is different. This is exciting. And uh, yeah, you know, there, this needs to be recorded. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. whether it was Roscoe Gordon or who or Ike Turner's Kings of Rhythm, mm-hmm. just there was something there, and, and not to mention a lot of great country singers. Uh, you right. know that is a you know, this needs to be this, I got to get this laid down. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, in other places would have said, I, I'm not interested. But, you right. Know. right. So yeah, you're right. I think he, he sort of had a genius of ear. Mm-hmm. In a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. So, it, uh, so you, you, uh, you, you didn't, uh, I had you pegged for a guy who, who sang in church. Or, when I was little, or, a little bit, you know, because we had to. We were Catholics. So we had to sing right. in choir, you know. Uh-huh. And, uh, All right. So you, the wrath of the nuns, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I faced that wrath a little bit uh, from time to time. <laughs> right. A good Catholic boy will tell you. Um, yeah, right on. And, uh, so, yeah, but, you know, no, I wouldn't. Uh, after, like, fifth grade, I was, I would never. I just, you know, I had just, I was just, I couldn't even imagine myself doing it. I just couldn't. Right. You know? Well, there's a time period for young, for, for boys and guys in general, where they where it's just not cool to be a singer. Oh boy. You're, yeah. Especially. Yeah. And maybe further back then, like, you know, when I was growing up, when my hometown, it was just not cool to be a singer. Maybe it is today, but well, uh, then it was funny, not. At jam sessions, uh, the guy in Kansas City that used to host them in the, the suburb that I grew up in, name is Mike Smith. Um, he was kind of our fearless leader. Now Mike didn't like to sing that much, but he said, "Which one are you?" So, "Okay, I'll do it." You know, it was kind of like that because nobody else wanted to do it. Right, right. You know, and yeah. uh, um, so he was always kind of our, uh, you know, the man. You know, the man we all looked to uh, to get approval for. You know, right, uh, right, sure. Or approval from, mm-hmm. approval from, you know, that was, that was a thing with Mike and uh, yeah. And, and my best friend was writing songs when he was 15 and he had that, he didn't really care about singing that, but he just started penning tunes, like, you mm-hmm. know, as a kid, you know, and he just could, you know, just chunk them out. It was unbelievable, yeah. you know? Right. right. So I, but I didn't start like sort of trying to write things, write pen lyrics and whatnot until God, I was probably close to my 40s before I did that. You know, I, I, a right. couple of things here, but then I started, you know, mm-hmm. go to jam sessions and do the same stupid songs every time. I thought, you know, I could just take this and I'll just make up my own, right, my own stuff. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of how that kind of got going. And, and you've recorded three, three, four, three, kind of a lyrical style of sorts. Right. Well, uh, you, now you've recorded three full length records uh, of all material that you've written, uh, right? Hey. Two with Roomful. I've done. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, done uh, I've done two in Canada. I've okay. done two in Canada. I've done one, a live one here a year and a half ago. And then I did uh, the, fir- the first one in Canada, the second one here in Seattle uh, with the band I generally play with now, which is Billy Stapleton on guitar. Uh-huh. And then uh, I just, the live one I did was with Billy also and uh, my current band. And we're, get, we're releasing one from 2002, which is a from digital cassettes that we did right before I joined Roomful, which has a lot of pretty, I like material I'm very fond of, but uh, it, you know, won't have the great, it's going to kind of sound like that 
that Magic Sam record where some of that stuff is. Have you ever heard that live Magic Sam stuff? Where it's, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe there's a, some of it's the Ann Arbor Blues Fest, which sounds great. Okay. Some of it is just him in a club because nobody thought. You know, think about it. they never recorded. Think about it. they never filmed or recorded Little Walter in his prime. Right. I mean, you know, there's a couple of those European films uh, here and there. You know, and uh, yeah. they never really got. It would have been. Could you imagine if they'd ever actually got him recorded in 1951 or 52 when he Unbelievable. was, you know, you know, setting the world on fire? And uh, you know, it's like they never filmed uh, Sugar Ray Robinson boxing in the 40s when he was virtually unbeatable. Yeah. The uh yeah, it's sad, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. But uh yeah, the uh I uh yeah. Yeah, so, so I, that'll be my sixth album. And then I got well, half a record with Sugar Ray Norcia. Okay. In in Italy that I did with uh, Mauricio Puno over in, in Europe. And uh Ray does half and I did the other half, you know. Very so. nice. Very and nice. Ray's one of my favorite, you know, not only one of the a great player, fantastic singer. And just one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Right on. He's, one of the, he's really a great guy. And, you know, of course, we shared the roomful chair, you know. Uh-huh. And, yeah. Uh, well, you know, actually, go ahead. Curtis was in that, too. You know, Curtis had the roomful I, chair for, for a short time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was, as you guys sort of traded off there. Uh, but I can see why, listening to you both sing, you both come from the same sort of uh, school, it sounds like, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I guess soul music kind of, because, you know, I was an adolescent in the soul music era of, uh, you know, uh, James Brown, obviously, Wilson Pickett, Johnny Taylor, sure. you know, those, mm -hmm. and then Solomon Burke, yeah. and a million other guys, which, you know, I didn't realize that at the time that this was coming out of the gospel thing was the big influence era. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for and, sure. you know, and gospel singing's big. The big effect blues was kind of the one tying in factor for all these things. Blues singing is the root of most modern gospel, yeah. as well as soul music, and of course, you know, quite a bit even of jazz singing. Mm -hmm. Blues is a, you know, is, a, is at that root. I guess that's what kind of attracted me to it. Was that it? Sort of, you know, it's was the uh, the beginning for all of the rest. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And so guttural. So like, uh, you oh, know, pretty, yeah. it's so yeah. much individual, uh, you know, and uh, some cats are more trained than others. And that's great. And then some yeah. guys have no trick, but they just there's just a sound that they have. Uh huh. I know. Just like, you know well, like Wolf. You know? That's a, that's a great place to sort of segue here, uh, because, you know, you had mentioned earlier that you had you had taken some voice lessons. Uh, and I was just curious uh, if you could tell us about what it was that you learned uh, from from voice lessons that uh, or, or, or is what you're doing just what happens when you open your mouth. And there are guys uh, like that, you know, that yeah. just that's just kind of what happens. But Ella Fitzgerald, one of the greatest jazz singers, American singers of all time. I don't I'm told that never had a lesson. Yeah. Just, Hello. Here yeah. I am. You know, everybody else sit down. Here yeah. I am. And uh the, uh, for me, you know, I, the one thing that I did notice when I first started chirping, so to speak, yeah. um, was uh, I had volume. Uh -huh. and I, had, I had a loud, you know, I was a substitute teacher too. So you got to be have volume uh, when you're, okay. when you deal with eighth grade boys, you sure. need volume, trust me. The, uh, um, so I had that and, you know, somewhat of a range, but, you know, uh, when I got with George Peckham, who I'd been referred to by uh, Jeff Simmons of Frank Zappa fame, who's uh -huh. one of my dear friends here. Wow. And, and I called him up and at the time he was almost 90 and he took me on anyway. Wow. And so I worked with him for about, you know, in two different periods for a little over a year. And boy, he just, within six weeks of working, I almost increased my vocal range by a half octave. I couldn't wow. believe it. Just, wow. these, just pounding my head in with these old Italian I was going to say. And, and the Italian method is really the root of most voice training, most of it. You know, is that what you would call like bella canto, bella canto singing, like Sinatra, I, it, sort of it, that yeah, similar? Well, sort of I, have, I have Sugar Ray's, Sugar, nope. Ray, Sugar Ray Norsa, his dad was a voice teacher. Oh, okay. All right. And his dad was a choir leader and a voice teacher, and he wrote a book. And I, I, I bought the book from Ray, you know, just uh -huh. we used to talk about the mask. 
Yeah. And Sinatra talked about that. And uh, huh. um, the, uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, the range thing. I have a bigger range than some, you know, and uh, the, uh, but it was a gr very gradual process. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could say I just went out there and, you know, I was Paul Rogers in one day and, you know, was, uh, you know, killing it, but it, it you know, it, it was a slow, a slow process. We have a lot in common musically. I, I'm a, Paul Rogers is one of my favorite vocalists of all time. Yeah. I, uh, you know, that I still maintain that, uh, that, um, the, uh, that free album, uh, with wishing well is one of my favorite rock records of all time. Uh, yeah. there are other albums are good. That record particularly is, is really showcases, uh, yeah. showcases his voice, uh, and, amazingly. Yeah. He's one of my favorite rock, uh, rock. Me too. I met he, him once. The met really, him in Vancouver. Nice guy. Great guy. Seems like it. Seems yeah, like it. Yeah. A great guy. Really nice dude. Completely, completely down to earth. You uh -huh. know, that was, I guess my one brush with greatness. The rest of the people I met are just, you know, harmonica players that are more famous or better than I am. You know? <laughs> it was like, wow, there's a brush with greatness here. You know, I love it. You know, if you haven't seen just a little side note, uh, he, you know, as you probably know already, he joined Queen for a few tours. Sure, he did a there little is, bit. Of that. Yeah, there is a, a concert of him live in Ukraine with Queen that is on YouTube. The whole concert's there, wow. and, and he's he's singing all that Freddie Mercury stuff, but doing it, Paul Rod, doing Paul. Yeah, he's you know, I mean, Freddie was Freddie and Paul was Paul. And, yeah. You know, there's no other way you can, you know, right. it's like, a, actually, you know, some of my favorite singers in the world are not people with the greatest instruments. I mean, think about it. Louis Armstrong changed American singing. There was American singing before Louis Armstrong, and then there's American singing after. Uh, he really altered, I mean, and this is a man with an extremely had a limited range as you can have. Yeah. Uh, but yet the phrasing and thing that he he did had not been done a lot. Right. In fact, even Bing Crosby talked about the fact that, you know, his early. How he there was a very European style of singing mm -hmm. that people did, you know, doing yes. vaudeville and whatnot. And mm -hmm. he definitely put some of the first uh, blues inklings in there, you know, and as far as how to, you know, when he did a pop tune, it was not like hearing uh you know nelson eddie do a pop tune or whatever you know right was, for real yeah it was uh so you know he really uh and then you know billy holiday had an extremely limited range not really you know not an instrument like ella fitzgerald had but sure. definitely a huge influence wolf as we said yeah nobody sounds like there's no I guarantee you there's nobody in uh, nobody in russia that sounds like wolf <laughs> Like there's no, <laughs> no sir. You know, no. Well, there's this one guy down in the, the in Antarctica I've heard about. But anyway, the uh, the uh, but uh, you know the uh, yeah. I mean, there's just uh, you know, singing was fortunate for me. Yeah, uh, I was able to you know get to keep playing harmonica, but I could you know learn, and I had to learn how to front a band. That took years. Yeah, uh huh. Just getting uh -huh. at ease with that, I found. And you are so at ease at it. I mean, uh, you're 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 a really great frontman. You have a, a, a just a great personal well, thank style. You. I appreciate that. But it's, it's, yeah. I really appreciate that. That that's but it's taken a long time, you know, to yeah. to you know, yeah. You know, I wasn't the kind of guy who was thrilled at going to speech class in high school. You know, that yeah, was, yeah. That was, you <laughs> just dread, you know, you right. know, standing up in front of people. You know, now they can't shut me up, but at the time, you know, <laughs> they flipped the switch. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it was, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, I, I was fortunate. It was fortunate for me that, uh, you know, I, I learned, I learned how to do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that you have this instrument, this God-given instrument that it sounds good. It sounds good. I mean, you were able to expand your range and learn some technique, uh, yeah. but and you that, have a, you have an instrument that is very appealing. You know, what, what, what you can't teach, though, I I think, is uh, style. Yeah, and you can well, talk about it, but everybody has a style. They have or a potential style. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. It's listening and really practicing a lot to find your style. Mm -hmm. It's the only you know there are there's a few handful of people, like people who are just like in sports. I'm a track and field fanatic. 
there are certain people that are just born uh, faster than a hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and then, they're, you know, and but most folks, you have to in any sport, you have to practice, practice, practice until you find it, your style. And then you uh -huh. find how you make the, really the voice isn't so important. The harmonica playing is not so important. What it really is important is the lyric, whatever it is, and how you sell it. Mm -hmm. how the, it's all about songs. Uh, the song is the thing. Now, how mm -hmm. do you, the harmonica augments that song. Mm -hmm. Even some vocal acrobatics can augment that. But really, it's how, you, how, are, you, how are you telling that story? Right. You know, are, you making, are your words coming out so that people can understand your story? Right. Right. That's, you know, that's what I go when I listen to a singer. I'm listening as he commuted. I mean, Bob Dylan, the early Bob Dylan is one of my favorite singers, hardly a voice whatsoever. But he communicated to me. Absolutely. Right. You know? And so, you know, with uh, there's a lot of, you know, people in folk like that. They're, they weren't gifted with, a you know, a range or much of anything, but they could tell you a story. You know, mm -hmm. they could just uh, and that to me, that's the number one thing. That's, that trumps everything. Totally. I couldn't agree with you more. There's a little bit of an actor that has to be involved with being a great singer. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. No question. No question about it. The, uh, yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, I'm fortunate. Like, I get, I've got to be able to work with a couple of pretty good players over the years, too, that put up with me, you know, and my, uh, my weird ideas and, and stuff and my strange lyrics and uh, all of that. And, uh, well, let's talk about your, your songwriting. I mean, uh, so, you know, you, you mentioned that you had a friend when you were a teenager who was just a, you know, yeah. Song, yeah, Cardo, that was maybe your... Cardo Quintero. Yes. He's still, uh, he, I work with him still. When I go home to Kansas city, we always play a show together. All right. Well, as the guy, Mike Smith, I mentioned that we always play at BB's barbecue in Kansas city, although not this year, but we always have, we get together and, hammer through some stuff and uh uh yeah he's still writing now he still writes songs he's you know 67 and he's still pumping out tunes yeah. uh yeah the uh uh the uh you know so and you're yeah, I, i've been fortunate uh, along that line you know you, you were you, you know that was a, a, clearly an influence to, to you to be able to be like well maybe i can write some songs too and you have written a, a great number of songs tell me about your your sort of approach to songwriting. You know, some guys uh, sit down, you know, I live in Nashville, as I mentioned earlier. This is a town full of songwriters. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, they get up in the morning and they, like, go into work. They go make, they go somewhere, and by 10 o'clock they're writing, then they take a little lunch break, they come back and they finish it or start another one, and then they're done by 3 or 4, and they do yes. that every and day. They're writing for a very specific purpose, too, because right. those right. writers, they're, they're not unlike the days of... Uh, Tin Pan Alley. Or Tin, yes, exactly. The, the Tin Pan Alley, Neil Diamond and Carol King sure. going to work, you know, and then the, yeah. the Brill Building, New York. Give, give yeah. me a hit, kid. Give me yeah. a hit. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> right. And that's what they're doing. For me, I'm just writing for my own, you know, I'm, I'm realizing I'm not going to write any hits. I'm going to write some, you know, stuff. And I hope, you know, I get some uh, attention, whether uh, deserved or not. And well, uh, well, the, the word hit is a very, like, sort of, uh, uh, elusive, not elusive. It's it's a it's a it's a word that really doesn't really apply all, at to all. At, not you know what I mean? Does it too much. Once in a while, somebody can you know. Amazing that you know, scratch my back was actually a top forty hit when I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. That was, that was a rare moment of you know swamp blues actually becoming. Yeah. And when I was a little kid, and I heard that, I didn't know it was. A, I didn't know what blues was. I would couldn't even tell you. I thought it was a. A white beatnik with sunglasses you know that was the vision i had in my head of the song and uh, uh you know until a few years later you know mm -hmm. the uh um but yeah my own approach is 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 kind of i have a couple of influences i tell people all the time well who influenced your your warped sense of uh you know lyrics i go well there's a bunch of people i said i like to think my rhyme scheme comes from chuck berry mm -hmm. Imagery, kind of Sonny Boy Williamson, Rice Miller. I said uh, some of the uh, Randy Newman is a huge <sighs> on how my head works. Yes, he's great. And he's pretty astounding. Uh -huh. uh, you know the uh, um, and interestingly enough, another person that I you know uh, 
and of course I listened to you know Zappa and Beefheart a lot as a kid. Yeah, you know, I a lot. And uh, <laughs> uh, that's and, your twisted. Course, yeah, I mean you know Beatles and all the right. You know we all know the usual suspects. Uh, right, right, right. And, and then you know all the blue, uh, Willie Dixon, huge. I mean how, you know he's the George Gershwin, Jerome Kern, and Rodgers and Hammerstein of the blues, all in one guy. Yeah, for so, real. Yes. And I got to meet him when I was nineteen. No kidding. And Tell then that story. that's why I got interested in playing blues. I went to the Red Baron in Lawrence, Kansas. You had to drive to Lawrence to go hear a blues show. That's a great town. Yeah. You know, at that time, there wasn't anywhere in Kansas City. So you drove to Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. And you go here. So he was playing a little club and it was Carrie Bell. That was the first time I ever heard Amplified Harp. Love Carrie Bell. Yeah. Mr. Benton and Lafayette Leak was a piano player. Yeah. And uh, Bo Diddley's drummer, Clifton James, was playing wow. drums. So wow. Man. What, what a, awesome what a lineup. Band. Yeah. And I was kind of just like blown away by the whole thing. But on the halftime at the show, I got up to go and meet Willie Dixon. And there were a bunch of us around there asking every, what I call every dumb white boy question you can ask, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, the kind of, you know, what about the Yardbirds? You know, you know, just every dopey, you know, question you can ask. And the guy was an absolute saint. He was just patient with everybody, took time with everybody. And I was, I, I was just so knocked out. I said, this would never happen. You know, if it was a rock concert, everybody would be W.C. Fields and did you bother me? You know, that would be, yeah, 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 yeah. that would, that would be at every rock show you ever went to would be that way. You know? Right. And uh, whereas he was like in his club and I was like, I thought, wow, you can play this music until you're, you know, an old geezer and still have meaning. And, you know, and these guys are totally accessible. You know, mm -hmm. to me, Willie Dixon was a huge star. Yeah. You know, for to me, you know, he was. And, uh, but he was absolutely. And so that, that was one of the things that really blew me away. And Carrie Bell's harmonica playing was, you know. Mm hmm pretty cool you know pretty I mean? cool pretty man pretty cool stuff and uh yeah all of that so that kind of kind of then really started to turn me towards uh blues yeah. as far as learning how to play a music i still listen to all kinds of stuff but you know as far as you know you know and there were you know the, but the songwriting thing john entwistle is one of my biggest influences as a songwriter okay Isn't that weird and he just those first two albums his lyrics are um the, and, you know again his lyrics are warped i mean yeah. they're really warped and you know that just I don't know. Humor there yeah yeah and i'm not you know that just uh that all it stuck with me is that you know just how you know that kind of that cynicism that he has yeah. in there and that uh -huh. wit that he put in there yes. rick estrin has some not the interesting but rick estrin has a lot of the uh this was a big influence later lewis jordan there's a lot of uh -huh. Rick's writing songs. I was there's a first time, first song I ever heard him sing was Saturday Night Fish Fry. Okay, yeah, so yeah, all right. In '79, and uh, and Rick always has that sense of kind of the kind of stuff that Lewis Jordan used to do, which has a little bit of a, you know, a lot of comic relief, and uh, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. you know, just a, that kind of thing uh, yeah. permeates his writing, and it, you know, and Lewis Jordan was a big one for me too. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of, that kind of, those sort of songs, uh, yeah. always, I think, you know, that kind of sticks with me, you know? Yeah. A lot of blues, a lot of blues songwriting is like being Alan Sherman. It's like you, you find something that exists and then you try to tell your own story to something that's, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, you take, you know, you take a tune, just any kind of generic riff and then you try to reinvent it. <laughs> And reinvent it and put sure. your own personality into that. Yes. And try to find something that's uniquely your own. Uh huh. So you, I, I try to avoid too many baby, baby, baby songs. I figured there's a ton of guys who got that covered pretty well. Yeah, you know? there's a lot of that. Yeah. So you know, I, I kind of, I myself look for you know, you know, little edges along that, uh -huh. that line, you know, little points of departure from that uh, from that formula. So, you know, I love this insight that you're giving because this is a, this is important stuff for, for aspiring songwriters and guys who have even been writing for a long time. I mean, you, you spoke earlier about finding your sort of about finding your voice 
uh, as a vocalist, or and yeah. that works for on the on the harmonica, any instrument, but also yeah. it works as a songwriter. I mean, you have to find your voice as a songwriter. And you got to be patient. With yourself. You yeah. have to be patient with yourself. You mm-hmm. just got to keep, you know, you try and try, and you're going to fail on a lot of stuff, and you can't get, you know, you just keep, you know, you just keep listening to as many people as you can, and keep uh, keep trying to, uh, you know just you know pound the way you just gotta bash your head into the wall a little bit yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, uh, and put some ice on it and come down and then get ready to you know bash it again and uh, yes yeah you, you, you know what you have to develop somewhat of a of a thick skin because uh i mean for me i can only speak for me personally but it's like you know uh, uh self-doubt uh a fear fear is a killer right fear is a killer sure. And you just gotta sort of like lower your head and ram your way through it, no matter how bad it hurts. Mm-hmm. You know, just to some of, that, some of that comes with age. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm getting older. <laughs> yeah, so you get old, and then you just you know, you know, I don't care what anybody thinks. You know, you know. I've yeah. been I've been trashed in the Boston Herald before, so you know, I figured you know that. <laughs> yeah. I was, when I was with Roomful, you know, I got uh, I got a bunch of nice little reviews in different papers, and then I got some slammed awards. In the, yeah, you want some big awards, in the Herald, you know. And uh, tell us about your experience with Roomful of Blues. It was a uh, it was a group. That's thanks to my wife Laura. She really actually allowed that to happen because she had to hold the fort down here in Seattle. Mm-hmm. You know, while I went and uh, I was teaching pharmacy technicians at the time, and uh, so I. Uh, I left that job and then, you know, they got, they called me and, and uh, they were changing singers and wanted to give me a shot. And I thought, well, I've never been on the road before ever. Mm-hmm. Not really, you know, and, right, uh, right. and, uh, and so, you know, I just, you know, I just had that to, I don't know what do you say that Willie Nelson gets on the bus and we're on the road, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Her, yeah and, Jones. Uh, yeah. You're on the yeah, road. Plus it was the East coast. I'd never really been to the East. Wow. I've been to New York with my dad when I was a kid, you know, yeah. been, you know, but I'd never really, I'd never been in the state of Ohio. I'd never been in Pennsylvania. I'd never been in Jersey. I'd never been in these States before. So I was yeah. just kind of, I wonder what it's like living in new England found out quickly uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was a different different game it's a different game there for sure because and yeah the band you know the band i knew the band was going to be harder mm-hmm. you know if they didn't if they did you did something they didn't like they were going to go just right out and tell you yeah mm-hmm. you know it, it was you know out here in the in the northwest it's a little bit more touchy-feely and you got to be a little you know uh, a little bit more. You just can't go, you know, you just can't go up to your drummer and go, are you kidding with this? Are you kidding? Did, what did you, you know, <laughs> Rhode Island, they just say, you know, yeah. hey, hey, I love you, but you're stinking up the place. You know, I, kind of, <laughs> I, spent, I spent 10 years in New York City and uh, yes, yeah. I, I can relate. And you know. You yeah, know. I know. Yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, uh, so yeah, there was, I knew that coming into it, but I didn't, hadn't experienced it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah. so, so were they, did they, did they offer their advice on how you should sing or how you should play or all of it? Yeah. No, it was, it was basically uh, on certain kind of tunes where my own music had been a real combination of standard blues, rockabilly, and quite a bit of R&B, a little bit of soul type of stuff. It'd been quite a mishmash. This was, you know, we were doing pretty much straight swing stuff mm-hmm. and then some new orleans stuff to throw in there you know yeah. very little in the area of r&b not really doing much of any of that no. mm-hmm. so there's a very much a way you sing on or behind the beat that kind right. of thing and mm-hmm. so they, they you know they'd be they were critical of you know uh, timing and stuff yeah like I don't like the way you're the phrasing this on this you need to look at this yeah Just check this out there you know they'd even go here's what ray did on this if you're doing this tune you notice how he and ray's Sugar Ray's uh, timing is some of the best. Yeah, you can ask Kim Wilson. You can ask anybody. Ask Kurt. Curtis still got again. Yeah. Ray's got some of the the best vocal timing. He really. It's almost. You know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it didn't happen overnight, but he's got. You know. And so they would say, or you know, check out Jimmy Rushing's thing and the way he phrases this and stuff like that. And you know, this is what we're looking for. Yeah. So I had to, you know, re-examine, you know, seven, eight, nine tunes to, mm-hmm. you know, correct my, to get it in the pocket where they wanted it. 
Right. You know? And that's good. I mean, that's good. Any, I think any, you get challenged and it get, you know, anytime you can re-examine things that you're doing is, Definitely. You know, it's only going to help you. Absolutely. And there was very little, not much harmonica playing in room fold, you know, for, and nor should there be and a little bit of, you know, it's a little it's bit a there. It's, it's about the horns. It's about the horns. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I play saxophone too, very badly. Me too. I haven't played it, yeah. but I started on sax alto. Yeah. yeah. I got the tenor and terrible, and uh, but it was at least something else to look at musically, you know, just another. Uh, right. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. It's fantastic. Well, you're exp- you. I mean, you were nominated for a Grammy with Room Full of Blues. You guys won the WC Handy Award. You've won a ton of vocal awards. Uh, I mean, you must be so. Yeah, they've been pretty nice in Washington to me over the years. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, yeah, I've you know my bands won a few of the albums and stuff like that, and uh, it, you know. This is unfortunate. There's not very many places to play around here. It's pretty thin. At the uh, moment or in general? In, in general, it's pretty yeah. thin. Uh, I was going to ask you what the scene was like. <laughs> I mean, because I assumed it was fantastic because there's a handful of you guys out there that are just fantastic. It seems like you must be working all the time. There's some good players, but there's just not much, uh, right. much in the way of work. There's a, The one main club in Seattle was, was the Highway 99 Club, and it's gone. Okay. Uh, and there's really, you know, one of the problems here, this is you would find in San Francisco too. The rents are so high. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult for a small club owner mm-hmm. to keep a bar going or whatever and then have live music. Yeah. You know, and pay a band much of anything, let alone, you know, what they might be worth because right. the rents are, you know, and the tax, local business taxes and things like that are murder. Yeah on small business people. And uh, so that doesn't help. My hometown of Kansas City has got a little better club scene going. Okay. Not great, but certainly a little more, uh, Yeah. certainly a little more active than it is around here. Um, I love that town. I have family in that town. I just, I love it. There's so much. Okay, see? Is that right? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So you go, do you ever get back there from time to time? uh, It's been a couple of years since I've been there, but, uh, Uh But I do love, I, I love the town. It's a beautiful get, town. Get some barbecue when you go there? Oh, absolutely. Come on. And you know what else they have there? Great Italian food, like some of the best. Yeah. Where, where did you get your Italian food? Uh, my, my, my aunt and uncle took us out. I don't remember. But they did say, this is run by the mafia. This place is run by the mafia. Oh, was it cast <laughs> <laughs> It might have been. I don't know. I, I used to watch dishes there. I was. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> I grew up there. Great food, yeah. It's a uh, there is some good Italian food in Kansas City. Rhode Island have wonderful Italian food. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I actually that's the one thing I miss about Rhode Island. <laughs> I miss you know, miss the Italian food. Uh, yeah. You know, I do miss it because there was it was it was cheaper there because it was so competitive. Uh huh. You know, there was so much of it. You know. It yeah. Was, yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, you mentioned that. Uh, um, you know, towns like Seattle and, and uh, various other towns where their, their scene is sort of dried up. Uh, I found that it seemed to me when I lived in New York, I sort of watched the same thing happen. And it feels like all the people that want to be near the arts that have a lot of money go in and they love it. And they just they're like, uh, you know, that Steinbeck book where the, the guy loves the puppy, but he, he just squeezes it to death. You know what I mean? Uh, of yeah. and men. It's uh, yeah. like they squeeze Plenty. the art right out of that town and then it's dead. And then it's like the reason they wanted to be there in the, to begin with is, is no longer there. It's moving yeah. somewhere else where the artists can afford to be. And I think a lot of it too, there's a, there's a generational thing too, um, as far as, you know, live music well in the baby boomer age group you were brought up in a period in that period of time you know the the top 40 of the day was very eclectic Mm -hmm. yes much more so very eclectic when you think about it it was very tightly controlled but very eclectic i mean in those days like in 66 you would hear you know you would still hear on rock stations, you'd hear Sinatra followed by the electric prunes. You would never have, you know, <laughs> you know, think of, you know, then the, it was very, uh, you know, just pre underground radio, which opened up a whole new thing. But, uh-huh. uh, you know, you had, uh, 
you know, you had this, you'd have the, all the Motown and Stax Bolt and, yeah. and uh, James Brown and the Beatles and this animals and all the British invasion all followed with, you know, occasionally Johnny Cash and crossover. So you had an astounding variety on it in, in a top 40 for, in the format. And I think that uh, it created a sense of eclecticism among that generation as far as, uh, you know, into the, that well, it went right into the 70s. And as things became more AOR and tightly controlled and, it, you know, mm -hmm. also there wasn't the computer thing. So kids, you know, I always like to say kids now have been raised by robots. Yeah. In a sense, musically speaking. Uh-huh. And even though everything's at your fingertips, they're just not aware of a lot of the things that are are out there or yeah. you know have been there and it, it's tougher for a regional artist yeah to uh, you know get particularly when you have an american idol kind of atmosphere where somebody's kind of you know what's the word i'm not saying they're not good singers or, or anything like that or untalented but they're sort of like you become famous without paying any real dues yeah yeah and I have somebody throw a full bottle of beer at you sometime to be in a minute. <laughs> Man, yeah. And that, you know, and then, yeah, yes, and exactly. The and harmonica, then the harmonica saved me. You know, it was like that. It, was, <laughs> uh, it had gone through my chest, except for I had the... Uh, I had the chromatic there and it's blocked it. Right, <laughs> right on, right on. Me, so, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Dave Grohl has a has a great, uh, you know, I would I would be paraphrasing if I were to, to, to say it, but basically the gist is, you know, if you want to become a rock star, you don't go stand in line and uh, wait to stink, sing, you know, a, a verse and a chorus in front of a, a bunch of judges. And I can say this because I was on one of those TV shows. I was on a TV show called Nashville Star, first season. Oh, wow. Uh, the first year, season after uh, the first season of American Idol, I believe, and this was sort of the country music answer to that. But the difference was we were we were uh, expected to write our own songs and you know those kinds of things. But um, I guess that's my defense of it. But uh, yes, I, I I had paid an, a lot of dues before that, and I paid a lot of dues after that. Yes. After that, uh, and then it made me better. You know, to I think I think you need. In most things in the arts, whether it's music or whatever, mm. for lack of a better way of saying it, you need some ass kickings. Mm -hmm. you, you need to get your your butt kicked some, you know. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's you just it's just part of. Uh, yeah, it's like you know, it's like if you play pro football long enough, somebody's going to break something. <laughs> at some right. point. Yeah. something's gonna get broke and, a, uh, you, know, right. yes. you know and uh you know it, i think in music that you know yeah you know if, if, i've had some astounding abuse hurled at me in canada you know <laughs> just, just some of these, back in the early 80s i mean just unbelievable places uh but you know those that's where all the good stories come from those those kind of things so you know maybe a couple of songs here or there yeah sure enough yeah absolutely, absolutely. you know there's uh you know i uh i just like i said i just hope i can keep doing it for a while well you i know? hope so too man because uh you know i'm a fan now i have uh, been listening to uh I, I was turned on to you uh because i was checking out a lot of these west west coast you know northwest players curtis as i mentioned hank shreve and, and the new Young hank yeah young hank yeah he's a good one he's, he's, a, really he's a good one isn't he yes he is and and yourself and then of course joe felisco mentioned your name and i'm like okay that's the second time uh, he's one of my favorites he's one of my favorites too yeah and what a wonderful human being and just another testament to the the type of the caliber of people that are hanging out in this harmonica community oh, there's boy there's just some you know i hear new guys you know I hear new guys, you know, doing the Howard Levy thing with the overblow thing and like, uh, you know, guys that I've never heard of before, some guys in Europe and stuff and just sure. going, geez, he's playing, you know, giant steps on a diatonic. I can bar <laughs> barely do it on a chromatic, you know, and uh, <laughs> you hear, you know, you hear some of these, you know, guys, you know, and it just is like, uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, it, I know. It, it's I'm, yeah. pretty amazing, you know. And uh, amazing. But I like you know Joe Felisco is one of my favorite players. He's he he does some of the most beautiful acoustic harp. I have a couple of his harmonicas. I hardly play them because 
Well, they're expensive. <laughs> yeah, I have one too, and I'm, 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 I'm I, I, I treat it gingerly. He did know. that, so maybe, he, yeah, I heard yeah. Kim Wilson say that. He's going to, he says, I don't use them too much because, you know, yeah. um, you know, but for a coup, I love them for acoustic playing. If a, in a duet type of thing, uh -huh. those marine bands he rebuilds are just amazing. Um, and uh, so I generally, my, my weapon of choice generally these days is the crossover. I've been using this. Uh, Beautiful harmonica. I think it is. This is a Joe design. I think it's a uh, bamboo comb, I believe. Yep. And, uh, I use that one. And, uh, and then I, for practicing, though, I don't use my, I don't endorse my honer, but I generally don't practice on honers. Really? I practice on yeah, because I don't want. I use the, these are for gigs, you know. When I'm okay. playing, I use my motors, but I have some some harps by all the usual sus the usual competitors. And some of which are just it's a good time for harmonica players because uh -huh. there's a lot of good well, it's good competition out there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the Zytles, which are expensive, are not are a nice or nice instrument. The Oscars are a nice instrument. Uh, uh, I just tried a Chinese one somebody sent me uh, recently. Uh, yeah. Tom Kang. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really nice one. And then the East Tops for fairly but good budget harmonica, you know. Yeah. For... <laughs> so I have some of these, and I generally practice with those things because I figure well, I can wear these out, but I don't want to, I want to be have careful. With my the, owners. And the owners are what I use. And for chromatic, I almost exclusively use owner, and they're just so expensive. But... Uh huh. You know, yeah. and they're a gr I mean, I say this almost every episode, but uh, because it's true, uh, the guys and gals at Honer are wonderful human beings, and they're so they supportive are. of of uh, their artists, and and they're yeah. knowledgeable about the products. Yeah, um, they've been nice to me. I can't complain. Yeah. Uh, the nice kids over at Honer. Uh, in fact, the only thing I'm mad about is I was going to be doing a clinic for them up in Bellingham a year ago, and then the COVID thing. Oh. Uh, it was just the week before we were going to do this clinic and uh, oh no yeah i know it was uh well, maybe they'll reschedule that i'm yeah. hoping i'm really hoping because i really look forward to uh i love doing a thing where you can especially with young players i really you know and and some women players too i'm glad to see there's a couple of ladies out there not just annie reigns right an awesome player sure, sure. Uh, but there's a few other you know uh, ladies there's a few in europe absolutely <laughs> There's some yeah. good ones, you know. I just uh, interviewed Rachel Plaz and she, or Rochelle Plaz, and I think that's yes. how she pronounces it. Uh, tch, yeah. ooh, what, she's a golden melody player. Honor, yes. Honor. yes, she's very, very good. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm very curious to see some, uh, you know, some ladies out there playing. Yeah. It's, it's a dude's club, you know. I and, know, right? We need some some estrogen in here. So we, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, definitely, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, set typically a baby boomer dudes club as it were, you know it's the, but you know i'm always encouraged when i see a young guy like hank shreve mm -hmm. um you know and some of the other there's been a few other young guys this cousin guys, Dean reinfeld is an amazing uh player too he's out of out of uh hamburg germany he's just he's he's sort of a yes baby school sort of player and then, you know and uh you know but most of my buddies are like you know the guys around here like kim field was a big influence on me because kim told me once he says I never took a lesson, but he he got he says, I want you to think of the instrument as a wind instrument, uh -huh. not as just something you blow and dry air out of. Yeah. The real wind instrument, you know. And uh, he would make me tapes of Walter Horton that I'd never heard of. And I got to listening to those guys from a different aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, before it was like I say early on, it was all chops. Mm -hmm. All just, yeah. you know, what kind of, you know. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Sure, right. I you know that kind of thing. You know, yeah, yeah. then when I tried to get that sound, no, I can't do that. You know? <laughs> like, no, I, I, you know, I have no clue what I have no clue what I'm doing. You know, and, uh, <laughs> the uh, you know amazing but, you how know, that happens. Yeah, yeah, you know. So yeah, it was a, it was a good you know. But Kim really got me to rethink the instrument a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, just by you know suggesting i listen to this guy or that guy and uh you know and kim had such a great sound himself he just yeah. had a big sound and uh the uh, and also a great singer you know there's a guy that again you know i knew him i knew him when and uh where he basically had very extremely limited range and stuff like that and over the years kim has 
gotten better and better and better at it. He's learned how to, part of it, I think there was a shyness in him that he, you'd never know, but, right. you know, he just kept plugging away. He made himself get good. Yeah. You know, he just worked at it. And, uh, now he's, you know, until he, you know, until he made himself. And so, you know, he knew, he learned how to really uh, project a song, how to project, project a lyric, uh -huh. and stuff, you know, and uh you know it, but it, it took it took time it certainly did for me you know mm -hmm. i've heard people know. say that sinatra inhabited a lyric and i liked i like that astounding, I like the I know. Sound of that. astounding. and yeah. his timing sinatra's timing was uh, uh -huh. only a handful of people that i can think of uh sugar ray is the sinatra of the blues ray norcia is, is the, the sinatra of the blues he's nice. he, he he has that he has that gift yeah uh, you know i'm trying to learn that gift he's got that gift uh because he can make a song he can make a song very convincing with very few acrobatics uh -huh. Uh -huh. i'm all for actor i love circus tricks i love acrobatics i do i try to throw some in you know to every show yeah a few harmonica acrobatics a few vocal you know, sure. Mar Mariah Carey attempts and uh, <laughs> things like that. And, uh, uh, you know, I've noticed about your vocals, if you don't mind my jumping in here, that how, uh, how, uh, easily you're able to, uh, access your, your head voice and back to your chest voice. You're, you're, you can really go through your, your, your break, your passage, you so quickly and easily, and it's strong up top. And, you know, that's, that's a tough thing for a lot of singers. It was a tough thing to learn. I had to work. I still work at it. I, I before I sing, even a re I'm rehearsing tomorrow morning with my Tacoma band, the T-Town Aces. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, when I go there, I do my half hour warm up before I ever sing. I, I mean, I'm religious about it. I was with Roomful. I always do 20 to 40 minutes of vocal warm up. Uh -huh. Just so you know, or else there will be no ease of range. The, the, a, it, it, no. There isn't any. You know, I have to gradually work up to that mm -hmm. yeah i wish i didn't have to work that i just wish i go in and just you know hello but you know yeah I gotta, gotta practice that stuff Absolutely. With chromatic harmonica i probably practice that more than i do diatonic uh -huh. just because of the i do something that not a lot of people in blues do um i can pretty much play blues in all 12 keys on the one chromatic which you know not jazz guys do that no problem you know jazz guys tend to play like jazz guys uh -huh. mm -hmm. i don't play i play at jazz i don't really play jazz okay. I, play, I play at it and jazz guys tend to play at blues and not play blues there's nothing wrong with that you know oh. but it's like you know but i i started so i started you know i've recorded in like eight or nine different keys on, on chromatic you know, on the one on the C and, yeah. I, and I can't play a, a, a chromatic in another key anymore. I can't play an A chromatic unless it's the standard third position. I can't do it. I yeah. Can't, I can't, my, my, I'm so attuned to just the key of C. Yeah. Jay Maven told me the same thing. He says he can't play in a, in a B flat harmonica chromatic or anything he's got it it's the only c is the only one he can he can play on wow wow and he's very effortless through the keys uh jay is um the uh but yeah you know i try to play your basic third position chromatic type of stuff except you know i try to play that in a and e and b flat and b and mm -hmm. different keys f sharp if i'm i, I never actually play an f sharp but you know. <laughs> That was a joke, right? But I'm looking for I'm looking for the tune. I'm looking to write a tune. That's my goal. I want to get an F sharp tune in here. So Stevie Wonder does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point at me, you know. Not, that's the, right. I love the, uh, so that's uh, that'll be the goal for the next year. Is there'll be a tune in F sharp. Um, Which, F -sharp yeah. Very good vocal key. F sharp. F and F sharp. F for you. And, uh, yeah, they're, yeah. They're I don't know. They're uh, they they have a nice thing at the up at the tenor you know, that, that that sort of that kind of tenor vocal uh, mm -hmm. thing and those keys work really well for me. Yeah. I don't know, you know. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm a baritone, so I don't I don't get I I don't go up as high. I don't sing as high as you do, but you, I mean you have a really you can reach some high notes. Once in a while, you know, sometimes boy, I hate boy when so when it's not there though. It can be it's like a violin. There's nothing more beautiful than a violin on the higher register when it's played by Itzhak Perlman. Yeah. Yeah. Or Pitch of Superman or, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. a variety of really fantastic violin players that are out there. Nothing is more gorgeous in music when those than when those people right. and there's nothing worse in this world than when I pick up a violin and <laughs> play the just like it's you know, the uh, the ice caps begin to melt and, and just the you know it's so you know there's a uh, when you hear that beautiful high end on somebody who knows what they're doing, you right? Know, a nice thing, and it, it, boy, so I go through that. Mm-hmm. Some days I can just tell it ain't here today. Yes, it's yes. Here, you know, when I'm on the road, I find like the first thing I do when I get up after I take a pee is I'm checking out, doing a little inventory to yes. see what's from the night before, or if I've been out, you know doing three or four shows that week it's like okay what am i missing where sometimes it's not even the upper stuff sometimes yeah. it's in the middle or in the in the low range and i gotta go you know go working to sort of coax it back out slowly throughout the day I, yeah you really and then also you have to think about that lyric and like i said the lyric trumps the lyric singing that lyric trumps any high or low end thing that you can do you know, mm-hmm. so sometimes it's the, my voice teacher used to say, sometimes it's best just to eat the microphone just a little bit and just try to stay on tune. And remember, it's just musical conversation. So keep it like conversation. Yes. And yes. Not so much worry about whether you're going to be able to, some days the nasal passage just ain't happening. Right, right, right. I hear you. Just, uh, some days the throat is is just yeah. not there and you, you have to, you know. I've made every mistake on stage that you can pretty much make, you know. I love and, it. And so, you know, just pretty much, I, you know, if there's a mistake to be made, I've, <laughs> I'm guilty, you know. Yes, agreed, me too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. So you just do your best, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's one thing that I, I like. I was saying I, I like playing the chromatic in some of these weird, you know, in in F and. Uh, uh-huh. And some of these other kind of alternative keys just because it it sort of makes me think about it. I have to every key on the one instrument chamber Wong once went to a clinic years ago and he said you know every key on this thing you have to kind of think of as a friend and some of your friends like G and D are friends that are easy to know and he said and some of your friends like F sharp or you know, F sharp or B flat yeah. or God forbid B. Yeah. You know, they're tougher to know, those friends, but they they can be just as rewarding that you know them, but they're just they're just harder people to get to know. Yeah. And so that's sort of, you know, that's uh a cool way to look at it, actually. I like that. Yeah, it's just like, you know, they're they're just they're they're just friends from a different background and they, they each have their own little idiosyncrasies and you just kind of you know, you get to know them. The guys that can do it on diatonic astound me. I agreed. I'm good at about you know four keys and then good night. You know that's the yeah the uh, you know that's uh, but yeah I have a couple of friends that you just yeah they Howard, can do that, like they that. Can do the Howard Levy thing. You know and uh, you know uh, Dennis Grunling is a fantastic player. Now he, I've never heard, he plays this great, great blues art, but I know he knows how to work a lot of the over bit and below some stuff really well. Mm-hmm. He's Apparently he can even do it tongue walking, I'm told, you know, and I'm going to, wow, you know, that's yeah. really amazing. Uh, yeah. And a cool guy. He's super cool. He's got yeah, that. I've never met him. We have kind of chatted email wise, but I, I'm a big admirer of his playing. Mm-hmm. It's huge. And he's one of the younger guys that I thought, wow, you know, he's going to make everybody work harder, you know. Definitely going to do that. And, and make everybody work harder. Dude knows how to dress. Like he walks on stage, and you're like, a star yeah. is in the room. He's like old Jim Meesey, the guitar player, Paul DeLay's old guitar player from Portland. And that guy, he, uh, amazing. I mean, these green, Kelly green blue shoes with an off green suit, just like the old, you know. Gotta love it. Little, short, little guy. Like unbelievable guitar player. Um, 
him and Paul DeLay were really a tandem for years and years. And there was something about his playing and Paul's playing was mm -hmm. different from anybody else's. And when they were together, it really, it was a certain magic to what they did. Yeah. Was, uh, DeLay was, in a sense, one of the most amazing players and songwriters, singers that I've ever heard. Paul DeLay was, I'm glad I got to call him a friend. Well, uh, he was also very encouraging to me. He said nice things in the press about me, which he didn't have to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark Hummel's done that too. Mark Hummel said, you know, nice things in the press. I mean, Mark, Mark's an old buddy for years and uh, also a cool but, guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable player too. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. The, uh, and, uh, but Paul was really one of the most unique. Uh, he just had, you know, they all his own way of walking, his own way of talking, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And yeah. he, uh -huh. he really, uh, I always say the, the guys that I think of the boomer players, you know, I always think of the for blues. I always thought, well, kind of the best guy around was Kim Wilson because, like I say, everybody raised it a game. Yeah, I said the most original guy in a way was Paul Delay because he had a he he just decided to attack the instrument differently, mm -hmm. yet play with blues tone. And he'd use a lot of old jug band style players and stuff like that, and put that into an electric situation yes you know and that really uh really knocked me out about him you know and he didn't sing like anybody else either you know yeah. uh -huh. when i first met curtis Salgado, he talked a lot about paul delay uh -huh. he was a huge fan yeah they were kind of rivals you know yeah. in portland and stuff but you know yeah curtis uh, really admired and respected paul a lot you know yeah he should he should be a lot more well known than he is he really deserves to be a lot more. Uh, yeah. I mean, in the harmonica community, he's super well known, of course, but outside, yeah. you know. Yeah. He deserved to be, uh, you know, a lot more well known as a blues artist. Yeah. Uh, you know, than he was because he was a lot more than just a harmonica player or singer. He was, you know, it was a whole package thing involved mm -hmm. there, you know. He was a funny guy, too. Yeah. He's good on, he's pretty good on stage. He's really, you know, pretty witty and stuff yeah it was, uh, i've noticed a lot of harmonica players are are very witty is it just me but it seems like maybe maybe we're quirky or something i'm not saying i'm funny i'm just saying but yeah. there are lots in the community yeah. that really are funny funny witty people yeah i think that's because it's kind of like you sort of know you're the uh, <laughs> you're the musical reject <laughs> In a sense, you know, yeah. most, I mean, if you look at comedians, you know, any uh -huh. of them, whoever, whether it's Richard Pryor or Bill Burr or whoever, you know, I'm a big fan of comedians. Yeah. Of course, this has never been a worse time in history than it is right now for comedians. Yeah. Um, this is the worst time ever. Um, but those guys tend, those guys and women uh, tend to be people who were rejected in their youth. Yeah. Right. And so either that can, you know, drive you half nuts or you develop your defense mechanism. In this case, they develop their, their wit and their humor. And I yes. think that's the case with a lot of harmonica players. They kind of like, you know, they're not playing guitar or keyboards or anything. They just sort of, <laughs> they, they've kind of like unwittingly became front men, whether they wanted to or not. And so they sort of, you know, developed, a, they kind, yeah. of developed kind of a persona. It's so true. So you true. Know? Yeah. For me, I definitely, that's definitely the case for me, you know, just being forced to be in front, you know, uh, yeah, and doing it a lot so that it becomes second nature, you know. Uh -huh. me, yeah, right? for real. Yeah, definitely. It's a, you know, and I'm not yet, I haven't been hit by the political correctness police yet. So, right. I'm the waiting. comedians of the world are, are, that's, I know that's what you oh, mean. Like, they, yeah, they can't make fun of anything. Oh, my God. What, what are they? Yeah. I mean, I've never, it's just incredible, you know, I, so I know my time's coming at some point. I'm going to, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do come for your daughters and from a someplace and, uh, and, you know, and I get to see them, you know, actually, I think getting outside. And, and, you know, that might be a, that might be a good thing for me, actually. This, this like <laughs> Elevate you. Parade of angry uh, <laughs> social justice warriors outside the club, you know, and uh, that might be a, might be a real boost. But, uh, <laughs> I love it. Well, well, speaking of boost, what what's you know, COVID is is pretty much you know maybe o over at least for a while. Uh, 
Things are coming back. Around here, not in Seattle. No, really. But I was just in eastern Washington, not one person wearing a mask. Okay. Nobody. Wow. Eastern Washington kind of has a uh, d- sort of defiance of the governor attitude out of there. Okay. You know, this side of the state, you know, it's much more of a, you know, if you know any, anything that's going on in this town right now, we're sort of becoming a local politics are becoming very, uh, I don't know, uh, extremely almost Marxist in, mm. in that sense of, uh, wow. it, it just, it's, you know, uh, I've always considered myself kind of politically a moderate liberal. Mm-hmm. And now I find myself, now I find myself going, you know, that Rush Limbaugh really had some good ideas, you know, so, oh. <laughs> something 10 years ago. No, it would never, they would never, I would have never said it, <laughs> never, never, you know, but you know, like just saying so, you know, but it, yeah, it is, a, it is a, it's an interesting time. Yeah. Thinking that, you know, there's never been in Europe, we did encounter a little bit of that uh, in Russia. A little bit of that thing. What are you know? Why why are you white people playing what essentially is an African American art form? Uh huh. You know? Uh huh. Really? You know, normally in Europe you don't really because they've been doing it's been yeah you know, fifty sure. years they've been doing that everybody's used to it it's no big deal right. Uh, you Russia know, was different, but you know I noticed it. It was definitely a few places in Russia we experienced. Uh, wow. You know a little bit not much but still some of the best audiences I've ever played to. Really, I was just going to ask you what, what was your impression of European audiences? Well, pretty cool. Yeah, you know, pretty Super good. Cool. Pretty good most of the time. Uh, you know, the uh, it's 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 interesting. Like in France, there didn't used to be a lot of blues being played in France, and not generally by white blues bands. You know, too often. But now it's pretty open for that. Or yeah. when I was working with these Italian musicians, it was always you know. Yeah good to play france and germany was always pretty welcoming uh, uh-huh. belgium and holland have always been kind of the hot spots mm-hmm. for that and then but with roomful i got to go to turkey and i got to go to russia and sure. i got and I, and I got little charlie and the nightcats on that tour nice man yes yeah, so they've never thanked me anyway uh <laughs> that's great Lorenzo, and lorenzo the bass player lives in tacoma anyway uh <laughs> no I, the, the promoter of that tour came to me and said who what band should i get here for next year so I, I said, so there's only one band for you and i said get little charlie and the nightcaps you know got the promoter could be with them and i think they did that tour twice wow it's an amazing tour the turks run it wow they run it with an iron fist. Even the Russians won't mess with them. Really? Uh, no. <laughs> There's, yeah, but it's great. You stay in nice. So you get a rose colored tour of Russia. Okay. So you got to play, you know, five cities or something like that and really yeah. nice hotels and, oh. uh, you know, and, uh, you know, but wow. the audiences in Moscow were pretty incredible. Yeah. It's the best illusion of stardom I've ever had. You know, wow. you know, Comrade, sign my wife, my girlfriend's cleavage. Okay, you know, you know, I love it. I love <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty astounding. You know, it was, yeah. uh, you know, the uh, I, you know, used to think, why can't they all be like this? You know? <laughs> can't yeah. all be like this, you know. But yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty amazing thing to to get. I feel very fortunate that I got to do that. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know? I mean, I'm, you know, quite happy getting to play here and stuff, but yeah, that was really a great experience too. Great life experience. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just going to Europe. I'd yeah. never done that before I joined Rumpel either. I'd never played in Europe. Look so. at the, all the places music has taken us over, all, you know, over these years, right? And he was taking you all over the world. Music can do that. Yeah. For you. I, I, you know, I worked hard to get there, but it was worth it because it was, you know, for me getting to, getting to, as a history, I'm a history teacher by, uh, degree. so getting to go to those you places know, and, and it, you get to see a lot of that uh you mm-hmm. know what little i could uh you know when we weren't working uh was was, was incredible you know to get yeah. to be get paid sometimes well sometimes not but uh oh yeah uh you know but to get it to go to see the uh you know a world war Two museum in the Netherlands or on the Battle of the Bulge field for me, you know, it was like uh-huh. I think it was like four WalMarts of tanks and planes, and uh, it, you know, I never would have got to do that had I not right you know, 
in place. So yeah, I feel extremely lucky that I got to experience that. A lot of players I know that are really good, uh, you know, will probably never get to do something like that. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel, uh, <laughs> I feel very fortunate. Yeah. You know? Right. Now, I can tell you a lot of other hard luck stories. I got plenty of those too. We, yeah. We That's luck. well, hey, you know what I mean? If you're going to be in the music business, get ready for both. Hopefully, yeah, yes. hopefully you get both, not just the hard luck story, because a, a lot of musicians only get the hard luck story. It's true. Yeah. I, mean, I hate to say that, but you mm -hmm. know, a lot of, yeah. And there is always that case of certain people, you know, produce many things that never gain notoriety until after sure they're pretty much they're dead and gone or pretty much you know not no longer active yeah uh -huh. you know and they don't really have the same chops anymore right mm -hmm. and you know and then other people make it really big young mess up and then they uh it's baffling they, there's no they, rhyme or reason i don't think it's like it's just there's a lot of luck involved in this business for sure. There's a ton of it. And then, you know, and then you, the, the, the discipline factor has got to be there. Yeah. It just has to be like any, you know, musicians tend to not look like some of their stuff, like it's not a job and it is a job and you mm -hmm. have to have a certain amount of that, you know, discipline. Yeah. As a, you know, to, uh, you know, that show up on time, yeah. be a pro. Uh -huh. Be a pro, especially when things aren't going quite your way. And, you know, yeah. don't yell at the people around you. Don't yell at the sound man. Even the sound man is the sound is not. Too I've been so man. guilty at the, of that a couple you of know, times. Just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've had you know, I've had a couple of friends of mine. I, you know, guys, I won't mention their names, but they're friends we both know. And yeah. I've seen them go, and I thought, you know what, you know, you you just put this guy. He's going to sabotage you at one point or the other. He's going to get his. You know. Yeah. It's gonna, so you know, true. You know, the best the, the best thing you can do is say, hey, can we try this maybe? You know, there's yeah, you don't get any harsher than that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, no, I'm with you. Uh, oh yeah. I mean that, that kind of stuff is uh, you know, it's inevitable that you know you're gonna part of the journey. Real yeah. you're in it long or enough, it's just gonna you have a guy throw a bottle of Heineken at you, you know. That, and, uh, yeah, so. that hasn't happened to me yet, but uh, yeah. I hope it never does. <laughs> it, it missed my head and hit my bass player's shoulder now. Oh, and you guys were lucky at that for that. Yeah. You didn't feel too lucky, but uh yeah, you know, I know it was like, you know, uh -huh. wow, you know, then, then, you know, in uh, Canada I saw some <laughs> really Canada I've only played Canada a couple of times I um, you know I played there a lot I played in Vancouver over the years uh -huh. a great deal because of a, a, a gentleman named Jack Lavin who was uh, plays some harmonica himself and a, is a fantastic bass player and a competent drummer and he produced two of my records and uh, Jack kind of helped me uh, make inroads to playing in Vancouver and okay. th there was a club called the Yale and it was like the, one of the best blues clubs on the West Coast. Curtis played there, you name it, they all, you know, they've yeah. all played there. And Lloyd Jones, uh, all the, the West Coast guys, Northwest guys. And, uh, you know, it was for a while, for about 20 years, it was a tr tremendous room. Yeah. But, you know, the younger, de it's not, the younger demographic isn't into this music as much. Right. It's so true. It's, you know, that's just that's a, a, hard, a hard nut to chew. Yeah, that, man. Yeah. You know, but, you know, but, and maybe that'll turn around. It could. It could totally do that. You know, if sometimes people get tired of the kind of the prefab, you know, American Idol overproduced digital auto tune and all that stuff. And that, you know, um, you know, the most loyal music fans, though, I hate, I hate to tell you, the heavy metal guys. They are in it, man. They love it. Those They're are the most loyal. Yeah. I can, tell things, I can tell you this from working the record business. Yeah. They're the most loyal fan base out there. Yeah. You know, as long as you don't do anything stupid, uh -huh. you know, they, those people, they will stick with you. They will, man. You know, I mean, you know, they will, you know, mm -hmm. come out and hear you, you know, do your thing. And, and, you know, and you can get, you can be an old geezer and they'll still come out and support some of those old geezer bands. Absolutely. You know, which yeah. I think, you know, so I, I, I tip my hat to some of the metalheads. Yeah. Uh, big time for that. 
You know, no, I, 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 never, I never knew much about that world. I, I toured with a, a group called the Trans Siberian Orchestra, and uh, oh, wow! So we, yeah. we toured. I toured Canada with them, and and half of the United States. They have two two bands. One one comes pretty much from the Mississippi to the West Coast, and the mm. other one plays pretty much from the Mississippi to the East Coast. And I was in the wow. East Coast group, and uh, uh, but this was my first experience meeting uh, metal heads. And they love trans, the Trans Siberian oh, Orchestra, yeah. and Great players. Uh, yeah. So I, I was just astounded. And some of these folks, you would see them at like six, seven, eight shows. Like they would travel, they would take the season to travel and f- kind of follow them around, the dead or something. It was crazy. It's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not ex- expecting any of that to happen to me. I just, in fact, I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. You know, just like when I. Uh, um the uh but it is astounding but it, i mean only the grateful dead is one of the only other bands i can think of where you had this sort of yeah traveling gypsy patrol and uh you know Jimmy, Jimmy buffett of, you know <laughs> with his yeah. parent heads you know oh yeah, yeah 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 well i know i know greg taylor a little bit speaking of a great harmonica player oh yeah absolutely taylor, excellent player great guy yeah. fingers is one of my actually uh i didn't realize it even at the time but when i first I found my first harmonica, started playing it, but I had been listening to old Jimmy Buffett cassettes sure. with tons of uh, fingers, Taylor all over it. And yeah. I loved the way he played. I loved that he had the country, blue, country blues oh, yeah. sort of thing going on. And then he could do, you know, he could, he gets very versatile. He could do a lot of uh, stock, stock blues really well. He could yeah. kind of do the Paul Butterfield kind of sound. When he, he used to be in that band, Larry Raspberry and the High Steppers. And that's when I first heard him. Okay. And he was really good, kind of the rock heart thing in a way. He played that really well. Yeah, he was very, uh, uh, yeah, a very versatile player. Good guy, really nice guy. And uh, he played, he sat in with Roomful a couple of times when we played in Detroit. Nice. In Detroit. So uh, Greg would come down and, you know, I'd insist to the band, come on, yeah. fingers, man, you got to, you know, come on, you know. Yeah. It's like another harmonica player. Huh? <laughs> just, Why don't you guys learn a real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right, yeah get yeah. out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. There was a Magic Dick had a thing, I think, in a, a big harmonica orchestra. Mm-hmm. You know, that he, okay. I forget, him and, uh, him and, PT, uh, and Pierre Beauregard. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, they had a thing, and I don't know, it's like, there's like 20 harp players and they had the whole thing worked out, you know, and then, yeah. and some of them were, you know, maestros like, you know, Dick and like, you know, like mm-hmm. Pierre, you know, and a few other killers. Mm-hmm. And then some of the guys were more even intermediate or beginning players, but they kind of figured out a thing. And yeah, one of the room full, they played, this is before I joined the main and the baritone sax player goes, anybody got a grenade? We can get rid of them all in one shot. You know? <laughs> so bad. So bad. <laughs> Oh, hey, I've done that, to, you know, with slide guitar players, you know, and then there's, you know, the little slide guitar festival, there's four of them up there at the same time. So, <laughs> get, get rid of them all at once, you know, kind of thing. So, I yeah, it. I love it. Well, Mark, yeah. this has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, time hanging out with you. And uh, I want to do it again sometime. I, I'd say that Absolutely. to everybody I interview, but uh, I've never, I never bullshitted anybody. I, I, I really enjoy hanging out with great heart players. Uh-huh. And uh, so, maybe next time we'll have to play, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, w- if you'd like to play, I know people would would uh, would love it. But if you know, it's up well, to I you. No I, don't know, I don't know what I would play. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You know, I, I start when I started this thing. I was also I was trying to like get everybody to do uh, a lick of the week for me, ah. and, it, and it became really evident quickly that m- most guys just kind of wanted to sit down and have it have a conversation which was fine with me. Uh, that was, you know, I, I want to, I really want, that was the whole uh, impetus to get me to do this. I wanted to just get to know, you know, legends and my heroes and stuff. And, and uh, so. Well, okay. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do one quick thing here. Uh, let's do a uh, slow blues and uh, let's see if I can pull this off. This is a uh, C chromatic and we'll try to play in B for just a few blues chops here, you know, Okay. No, that's not right. Okay. 
conventional D there. So there you go, some blues and B on the C chromatic there. Right? I love it. I love it. Fantastic, man. And there's a song that goes with it. I just haven't written it yet. Anyway. Okay. All right. I, lo- I want to hear it next time. Hear you okay. and hear you yeah, sing we'll a little it, next time we'll as well. It, uh, we'll have it. Uh, we'll have it ready to roll. Right on. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Dufresne, thank you so much for spending time with me in the Harp Slinger podcast. Tell everybody where they can where they can stay up to date with you. Uh, your website is. Is it's. Uh, Let's see. Well, we got to get that rolling again. I, we haven't had any gigs, so it's uh, yeah, true. But I, I know it exists. Com, you know, Mark there is yeah. a Mark Dufresne band, but we got that one has to be rebuilt. Uh, okay. Bass player had that developed that way. So yeah, but we're uh, my wife Laura is instrumental in helping me with that. So as soon as we get a few gigs, <laughs> yeah, sometime this year, we're gonna you know get the uh, the website up and jumping again. But, right uh, on. And you're on Facebook as well. People can reach you there. Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. If anybody can. I, I love, you know, I love doing nothing but uh, talking, about shooting the bull, you know, with anybody on via Facebook. Absolutely. Right on. But right it's on. It's been a pleasure. I, uh, you know, like I say, this is a, this is a strange cult that we're in. So, That's, uh, that, that we're a part of. I love it. Part of it and, uh, and I love being part of it. So, you know. Rock on, man. Rock yeah. on. Well, thanks for being part of this tonight. I, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and hope to uh, do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Peace and love to you, my friend. Absolutely. Take care, Danny. Thank you. You got it. My, my pleasure.